The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Hello and welcome to Postcards here on Pioneer Public Television. Postcards is our weekly look at the art, history, and cultural heritage of Western Minnesota and beyond. On this episode, one of our producers strikes television gold. After she told me about her historical discovery, I started calling Athena Kildegard our resident super sleuth. It started out with my just suggesting she work on a story about farming history in Stevens County. But once Athena started looking into the subject, she came across a single event, one that took place nearly a century ago, that may very well have changed the face of agriculture in the region. On December 9, 1913, in Morris, Minnesota, the streets were calm and the weather was spectacular, more like fall than early winter. The beautiful weather and an incredible effort of planning and publicity were about to bring an avalanche of people to this quiet prairie town. For the next three days, Morris was the home of the Corn and Alfalfa Exposition, a great fair arranged for the people of the region by the West Central Minnesota Development Association. The WCDA was an organization formed in 1911 to address agricultural issues. By 1913, the association represented a region covering 19 counties, from Redwood County in the southeast corner to Clay County in the northwest. There were many reasons for holding an exposition. Farmers in the area had been planting mostly wheat, and harvests for several years were barely enough to cover the cost of seed. Soils were being depleted by one crop farming, and for several years the especially wet weather had hurt the wheat harvest. It was time for farmers to diversify. In addition, there was a feeling that too many young people growing up on farms in west central Minnesota were choosing not to stay. F. W. Murphy, president of the West Central Minnesota Development Association, wrote, to the people of West Central Minnesota, The pioneer days have passed, and with them much of the pioneer spirit. The old order of things must change, in fact, is changing rapidly. The purposes of this exposition are twofold. First, we hope to have in attendance large numbers of friends and neighbors, and interest them in our common ambition, and make two blades of grass grow where but one grew before. Second, to demonstrate the latent possibilities of our splendid lands and convince our own people that they may successfully grow the two greatest crops of the present day. Let us gather at Morris and with a fervent spirit pay homage to King Corn and Queen Alfalfa. To ensure success, the WCDA hired a publicity man who made sure that newspapers around the state covered the coming exposition in Morris. One attraction of the exposition played up in the news coverage was that the WCDA had purchased five train carloads of registered alfalfa seed for farmers to purchase at the expo at cost. Alfalfa is grown as hay and is fed to dairy cows and other farm animals. Alfalfa grows quickly, and so farmers can harvest as many as three crops in a season. In 1913, a new strain of alfalfa was becoming particularly attractive to farmers in the region because it was hardy and resistant to wet conditions. 
Grimm Alfalfa was named for an immigrant to Minnesota named Wendelin Grimm, who came from Germany with a bag of alfalfa. He settled in Carver County and planted alfalfa in his first fall. It was a particularly severe winter, but some of the alfalfa survived, and over the years it developed into the hardy seed that would prove to be so attractive to western Minnesota farmers. In 1910, there were not 3,000 acres of alfalfa in all of Minnesota, but between 1913 and 1916, over 35,000 acres of alfalfa were planted. One thing the WCDA did for the region was to place an agent in every county. These agents spread the word about new farming techniques and improved machinery, taught farmers about avoiding hog cholera, and helped farmers improve their living standards. County agents agreed to devote their attention to building relations with farmers clubs, country churches, high school agricultural instructors, commercial clubs, and others. In Morris, all of these groups got behind the Expo, including the West Central School of Agriculture on the grounds of what is today the University of Minnesota Morris. To defray expenses, the local finance committee asked Morris businessmen to donate funds. $3,000 was raised immediately. That's almost $65,000 today. The newspaper story reporting this remarkable sum noted, Considering the size of our town, this is a magnificent showing, and our people are to be congratulated on their progressive attitude. A special song was written just for the exposition and was reprinted in newspapers around the state. The song celebrated the region and the virtues of alfalfa. West Central Minnesota, oh, it's good enough for me, the song began. It ended, we can all get rich and happy, and that sounds good to me. It's the best crop on the face of the earth, alfalfa for me. Women's clubs from several churches provided lunch on the days of the exposition. Businesses in Morris gave away prizes to visitors during the expo. People opened their homes to visitors since the three hotels in Morris were booked solid. The butcher gave extra cash for dressed poultry during the days of the exposition, presumably to feed the enormous crowd. Owners of automobiles, a novelty in those days, volunteered to drive visitors around town. Additional trains were arranged to bring people into Morris. One train arrived Thursday afternoon with a 75-member contingent of Minneapolis bankers, businessmen, and manufacturers. The train, which included seven sleeping cars, served as the hotel for these men. The county agents also worked to build boys and girls clubs. It was hoped that these clubs would create interest in farming. Farmers of all ages were urged to enter their best examples of corn and alfalfa to the expo. The prizes for corn alone amounted to more than $2,200 in cash or in such items as a cream separator and a stave silo. The boy who took first place for best acre yield for corn won an all-expenses week-long trip to the Minnesota State Fair. Another effort to draw crowds was the award of a silver loving cup to the county that brought the most visitors to the expo. Stevens County, where the expo was held, was exempted from the contest. Competition was tight until the last day when a train from Polk County arrived with 1,500 people, 87 school children from Starbuck, and three bands. The Minneapolis Tribune reported that when the people stood on the sidelines and watched the crowd of Polk County supporters go by, all of them threw up their hands and admitted without further argument that the Loving Cup would be in the place of honor in the Glenwood Courthouse. 
In February, when the loving cup was presented to Pope County, a fattened 1,310-pound Hereford steer was sacrificed on the altar of community entertainment and barbecued by the Glenwood Chief of Police. Committees of young men decorated downtown Morris. They strung electric lights across Atlantic Avenue, hung yellow, green, and white bunting in all the shop windows, built an enormous corn shock at one intersection, a pyramid of alfalfa bales before the armory, and most impressively, an alfalfa arch that crossed Atlantic Avenue in a stately curve that drew lots of attention. The exposition itself had something for everyone. In the armory, the main venue for the exposition, visitors first admired a great map of the West Central Minnesota Development Association's territory created out of shelled corn in different colors. The background was created from green alfalfa, and hidden electric lamps lighted up the map in a striking way, showing off also the theme of the exposition. Visitors could enjoy an exhibit of farm machinery, learn about the work of county agents, and tour a model farmhouse with rooms featuring such newfangled attractions as a medicine cabinet and a modern range. Also on view were a model farm featuring a dynamo driven by a gasoline engine and storage batteries that was being used to light the exhibit hall. Throughout the three days, people attended speeches by agricultural specialists from as far away as Chicago and Ohio, as well as George E. Vincent, the president of the University of Minnesota, Governor Eberhardt, and Dean A.F. Woods, Minnesota's great agricultural educator, as he was known. At the Orpheum Theater in downtown Morris, the University of Minnesota Drama Club presented two productions, both of which sold out. Here, too, visitors could attend Moving Pictures, a popular new entertainment. All the planning and promotion paid off. Over the three days of the exposition, some 20,000 people came to Morris, increasing the population of the county seat by over 200 percent. The Minneapolis Morning Tribune called it an avalanche of people. This unexpected crowd created challenges. Venues for the speeches weren't big enough, and so makeshift platforms were erected outdoors. Many of the speakers had to move from one platform to another in order to reach the crowd. Some gave the same speech ten times in one day. Planners organized an extravagant banquet for 700 people on the last day. But so many more people wanted to attend that the banquet was canceled and people were fed in the hotels and cafes and even in private homes and still, some probably went away hungry. But, wrote one journalist, mental rather than material food was what the people had come for. The crowds were undaunted. As one journalist reported, not one of the thousands who were in Morris went away without taking with him a new conception of what community life and cooperation can really accomplish for the common good. W.P. Kirkwood, a writer who went on to organize the first journalism classes at the University of Minnesota, reported on the exposition in the Minneapolis Journal after it ended. He remarked on the singing between speeches. The audience started with the tune written for the expo. Then they sang Onward Minnesota, then America, and finally they sang the Star Spangled Banner. Kirkwood wrote that by the end, There was a note of fervor that had not been in the other songs, and the opera house rang out with the music. One saw that the WCDA had been doing something really greater than it knew, it had been making patriots as well as better farmers. 
it had been making a higher citizenship, higher on the spiritual side as well as on the material side. Kirkwood's remarks made just months before the outbreak of World War I today seem particularly poignant. There was no doubt then, though, the corn and alfalfa exposition in Morris lived up to its motto, let's grow. Many thanks go out to the folks at the Stevens County Historical Society, who were a great help to Athena and editor Tim Bakken as they were putting the story together. Next, we head to New London to meet a man who wears many hats, community leader, musician, and artist, Bill Gossman. The first part I did was called centering. This part is called uh, opening and drawing up the first, uh, the first pull. And I'll do one more pull and then the shaping with my tool, with my rib. Bill Gossman is on a roll on his wheel. The flywheel underneath here where I'm sitting is probably 160 to 180 pounds and it's wide and it has a lot of momentum. So when I kick it, it keeps its speed for a long time. And the bearings, you can probably hear that. They're not the, the best bearings. This is an old, old kick wheel. bearings were better, they'd be a little quieter. It's kind of like us, when we get older, we get a little, our bearings wear out too, and we get a little more noisy. From his basement studio in New London, Bill has been molding clay oh, and water into useful pieces together. of art for over 30 years, and he's got a system. I prefer to make things quick because then I can, uh, clay doesn't absorb as much water, it stays, is more responsive when it's, it's less responsive to the touch when there's a little less water in it, but I have a little more control over it before it gets too hard. Yeah, well the water is the lubricant and if I don't have enough, the right amount of lubricant on there, then I, uh, changes the way that I, I work on the piece. Small pieces like this I like to make on the kick wheel or on a manual powered wheel because it gives more uh, more life to the, the piece. Larger pieces I'll make on the electric wheel but that has a constant speed and that's a little, the shapes become a little more cold and a little more refined. Well, I know what I'm making, so I don't have to think about it too much. From his experience, Bill knows what attracts the eye of the customer. These are going to be, uh, these are beer mugs. These are more of a seasonal thing. Don't sell too many of these in the winter, but people like to have them in the summer for enjoying their favorite beverage. I'm just going to use this to form the outside piece here. And I'll put a little line in at the bottom with my fingernail. And one final shape here before I cut it off. Bill peddles his products throughout Candy, Ohio County and central and western Minnesota. And he travels to shows. His customers say they like the personal touch he puts into his pieces. Well, it is alive. I'm giving it some life. It's important for handmade things to have a personality and not be a, a clone of the one before it. Before his solo work took off, Bill did that clone kind of work, as he calls it, working as a mass production potter, making thousands at a time. Today, there is more care in his creations. Now, these are some pieces I made yesterday. So these have been sitting out with a light piece of plastic on the top of them overnight. They were made like this in two pieces. This is the first, first piece I made. 
and I measured that, then I made the second piece on the wheel. The first piece looked like this when I was making it on the wheel. After it had stiffened up a while, I put the texture in with a piece of rope. Then I made this piece on the wheel like this. It looked like this when I cut it off. I had to measure the two so they would fit together like so. Oh, that's the wrong one. Here we go. So they would fit together like this. And now what I'm doing is I'm trimming this extra clay off on here. I learned how to make pottery in, in high school, way back in the 60s. And the first piece of, of the any, first time I touched clay was in kindergarten when we I did the kindergarten uh, what key, you know, spoon holders or whatever you did, coil pots. But I still remember that, making that coil pot, and it, it's a memory that I've had ever since, making that little coil pot and brushing the glaze on. It's something that struck a chord with me back in kindergarten. And I got back into it in uh, high school, learned how to make pottery on the wheel. Besides molding clay, today Bill Gossman molds public policy. A year ago, this quiet craftsman took office as mayor of New London. I wanted to get more involved in, in local affairs, at least find out what was going on. And I started out by complaining to my neighbors and friends that nobody else was interested in this and that of the city works, city workings. And people got tired of me saying that all the time and said, well, why don't you run for mayor or city council? So I thought, well, why not? I'll give it a shot. While he feels that he's providing a service to the city as mayor, Bill Gossman has certainly learned where he enjoys himself most. I really relish my time coming into the studio. And uh, it's the thing is, I can't come down here for two or three minutes at a time during the day. It, has, it takes 10 or 15 minutes to get set up and get everything ready to go. So when I'm here, I, I stay down in my workshop for at least four or five hours at a time. Now, imagine six artists and a team of 32 volunteers combining to make a giant artistic statement. Two years in the making, in all, the artist created nine mural panels, each one four feet by eight feet, that represent different cultures found in southwest Minnesota. Our Andy Garski shows us the finished product, which is called Mi Casa Es Su Casa. My house is your house. One of the things that I do is run the Marshall Community Circles of Marshall program. Uh, which is part of Intercultural Communities Uniting. It's a group of people who come from all parts of the world as well as all parts of the United States. The one characteristic is none of us were born in Marshall. Uh, and we all are people who really have a sincere desire to have relationships and get to know people who come from other places. What we're trying to communicate through this kind of mural project is all the ways that we are connected the similarities as well as those particular cultural differences. What I've loved about the murals is each of them uh, has cultural sign points that you can look at and say this is from a particular culture, but then there also are those universals of relationships, um, of family connections, of history, uh, and also of all of the light and the sense of life and color.
for me, the real meaning, well, there's, a lev there's several levels of meaning here for me. The first is that uh, uh, creating art is as much a spiritual and enjoyable function as just going to watch it, uh, and something that I think we, we miss in our Western culture. The second thing is, uh, we are such a diverse culture, even here in Southwest Minnesota, that we needed, we were looking for a way to be able to communicate not just our differences, but our similarities. And so the idea of mi casa es su casa, my house is your house, is a way to talk about something very important to every culture, which is hospitality, and yet honor all the different ways that our cultures portray it and enact that. What I try to communicate is, uh, you can see in the painting, is like a sunrise, um, it's like a start a new day, new day for many immigrants the different parts of the world. They come into America to pursuing happiness, pursuing new dreams, more opportunities. And then what I experiment in my life is people is very receptive to giving a welcome to immigrants, it's trying to help in one way or to another. One of the things that's been wonderful about this project and how I've watched it bring people together, uh, students from the university have come to me and talked about how wonderful it is to see faces that reflect their community and their culture, how it feels like there's a, a part of their home here. And other people from the community have come in and, and looked at all of these and, and have their own particular favorites, their own particular journey stories from how their ancestors came here. And we've, this art has been an opportunity for people to really share and to open up. It's not just about these cultures because this only represents a small slice of the cultures that are in this area. But by having it here, it's given an opportunity for other people to, uh, to share what is similar or different about their stories. I've heard about grandfathers and great-grandfathers, the ships and the covered wagons and the sod houses and the different ways that people have made their way to this part of Southwest Minnesota. And that to me is always the gift of this kind of art. And that's our program for this week. We thank you for watching and hope to see you again right here on Postcards. Do you have an idea for our show? Maybe you know a wonderful artist or musician. Or do you have a nugget of interesting history to share with viewers? Drop us an email at postcards at pioneer.org. That address again, postcards at pioneer.org. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008.